one of the things that I remember, because in those days, what blacks also faced was the bigotry of low expectations. Mm. We were not expected to be leaders and to be smart and be intelligent. And I remember a uh, the, the husband of a teacher, I got the word that he didn't think I could do it. So for four years, I lived in that library because of, he was not going to be right. And that was actually the way our community was raised in those days. If so told the you, oppositional force was actually the gift? It was, it was um, motivation. Mm-hmm. Uh, negative or not belief, being an underdog was true motivation. And it's just a great place to be. And I will say that to anyone. If you ever find yourself being in that underdog place, embrace it. It's not only what you get a chance to prove yourself that you can get it done, but to prove other people that they misjudged it. Welcome to The Middle. I'm so grateful that you joined us today. And we have a special treat on the old couch. Burgess Owens is here with us. And he is in the middle of a specific story. But I told him right before we started taping that we could have him do multiple episodes because you've lived the middle of a lot of different stories. Currently, you're in the middle of a political campaign, Mm -hmm. which is maybe not as familiar for our viewers. They're not choosing to enter the politics world, the political world. The political world to me is um, maybe even more intense than some of the other fields you've been on. You've been on the NFL field. You played in the NFL, you even have a ring from that. Do you want to show our camera? I do. <laughs> uh, and for those that are looking, that's when the Raiders used to win football games a long time ago. For those who don't have gray hair, yes, they, we used to win. Believe it or not, it was a time. <laughs> but you also, we, we <clears throat> talked about before we started taping that growing up in the South, um, your, your football career, and then trying to do post NFL life, which is its own middle story, right? And then struggling, just like many of us, to take care of our families, to work on our marriages. So we have a lot we can jump into. But I, I want to give our viewers that maybe aren't familiar with your backstory. Okay. <laughs> tell us a little bit about what growing up in the up in the South was like. Okay, that's good because it it kind of also defines what my middle is, and the, it's, the middle is actually not so much what I'm doing today is what I've been prepared to do from the very beginning and what I'll end up doing until my very end. And it's the same message. It's the same mission. Um, and that mission basically is I've always had a desire to make sure that those particular young people who don't have hope have hope. So whether it be at the very beginning where I'm learning what that looks like to where I can now begin to give that back it's all part of this, the same um, end game. So I grew up in deep south Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, days of, uh, in the 60s, days of KKK, Jim Crow, uh, segregation. And, and I know the the initial um, re- re- response for most people is of one of, boy, you really had it really rough. Right. But I, I want to give a different story. Okay. <clears throat> because one thing about America is that this is the one place in the history of mankind that gives us hope. As long as you have hope and you feel that this is a place of opportunity, it can always be a very positive place to be, no matter what our environment or limitations might be. So the the black community, just like every other community, we had the same options in terms of embracing the tenets to make our country great. Mm. And for those who listen to me, I talk about his head, 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 heart, hands, and home. But the tenets that makes our country great says that whoever embraces it is literally one generation away from the middle class. It doesn't matter what our color is, how we came here. Um, and those tenets basically are is, is head, which is education, right. heart, which is faith, hands, which is industry, free market, and business ownership. Being a, a worker bee, right? Exactly. And home is family. You commit to those four tenets. Truly commit. Be loyal to those, those commitments. You literally cannot help but be hopeful and optimistic. And no matter what environment you're in, I grew up in a segregated community. I could not have been raised in a more... Uh, a bit more blessed community because we were winning. We had examples around us of those who were patriot, who were patriots to our country, who loved God, who respected God, country, family, and women and authority. We were taught that. And if, if I was a young man and decided I wanted to not do that, I had to do it with my dad. And my dad just was not very tolerant <laughs> of 
being disrespectful. That's bad behavior. Exactly. So we learn to be disciplined. We learn to, to understand what respect really meant, which is means we don't keep emotions on our shoulders. We are, we're thinking through of what it is to make sure we have a good family name. Uh, so, <clears throat> I, so what I hear you saying is that even though it was segregated, it was the Deep South, it was, you know, at the prime of intense racial tension, you felt like it was a gift to be in those communities because the examples around you were one of industry and of respect and of faith and that that served you. There wasn't this, this sense of we're stuck, we're victims. We can't change our reality. What it, what it served me to, to do and see is what comes out of that because it's not hypothetical. What can happen when you take those four tenets? I lived it. We lived in a community in the 40s, 50s and 60s, which is not being taught. I think the big, our greatest enemy is the ideology that keeps us from our history. Because once we learn our history, we not learn what we the people have done together. We can't help but be proud of our history and appreciate where we are today and have a greater vision for our future. So I lived in a time, again, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the black community led our country in the growth of the middle class. Men matriculated from college. Men committed to marriage over 70%. In my community as a kid, I knew that there was, if there was a guy who did not commit to his family and be loyal to his family, he was a low life. We just didn't respect him. Mm. It, it, was, it was no escaping that we did not respect a person like that. And the last thing is we also had a community in which 40% of our community, black community, was, middle, was uh, business owners, entrepreneurs. Now, that translated to across our country from D.C. to Tallahassee to Texas to California 50 to 60 percent of black Americans in the 60s were part of the middle class. So I know what it is to no matter what the obstacles might look like or what the story might be, be told. I know what it feels like to literally dream big and to have no limitations, to see around me business ownership, to see Speed's uh, service station, a, a, a Perkins hardware or Baker's pharmacy or the hospital of black doctors and black nurses or coach will tell you work hard and you can overcome anything. That was the message that came out of that community, and we were succeeding because of it. So because of that, I now know what is capable of any person, uh, community, because if we can do it in the days of segregation, of Jim Crow laws, anyone today can be successful if they just go out there and apply those same tenets. Anyone. It's no excuse. Uh, the first thing you have to recognize, and I think at, at the top of, the, of, that, of that process, is that we have a God in heaven mm. who will bless us, who will make sure that our efforts are, will, be, will be rewarded, even if it's not at the time. But with time, with faith, it all works out. If you do that, then you have this feeling of optimism. We as so a nation, your, your faith was <clears throat> really the foundation for that sense of hope. It was, it was the faith uh, that our community believed in. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a faith that uh, when the black community came out of slavery, it was the one thing that we held on to mm -hmm. that allowed us to to succeed. To succeed. Um, I, I, I recently talked at, at a convention, at the RNC convention, about my great-great-grandfather, Silas Burgess. Uh, it was I, a great speech, by the way. Thank you. Well, one of the things I, I haven't mentioned, but I've come to understand, because here's a, a young boy, eight years old, being sold on auction block, orphaned, and sold to a very, very mean uh, uh, plantation owner, and escaped because of the... The, the belief of the people around him, adults, that freedom was worth taking a chance. And they went the southern route of the Underground Railroad, which was facilitated by German and Mexican Americans. Made his way out to Texas, became very successful. Um, started first black church, elementary school, owned 102 acres of land, paid off in two years. But the real story behind that is what he learned as he went across the country. He came across in a horrendous state in which people treated him very bad. He lived on a plantation, a horrendous state, but he, he, he touched lives of these Christians as he went across the country that just opened up the doors for just a little bit, maybe give them a field and they can sleep in or food they can eat, and they made their way to freedom. And somewhere along the line, he recognized that all white people weren't bad, that there was a God in heaven that loved him, and that if he can embrace what he saw within these people that he met, that he can be happy. So he was able to forgive, move on, and be very productive. He was a very, very proud American, a strong Republican, an entrepreneur. And that was the beginning of my lineage that I, I didn't know my great-great-grandfather until seven, eight years ago. But I did know him through my father. Wow. 
So, and yeah, that's so. That's like a bonus middle story that we just got about how that then those values were translated down to throughout you. generations, throughout right. generations. When you were growing up, at what point was football on the radar? Like, when did that enter the story of you're raised with these values, you're you're empowered, even though there's opposition all around you yeah. on a cultural level, <clears throat> you were also being taught and and shown examples of of perseverance and not giving up. When did football seem to be part of the story? Football was a bonus. Okay. All right. So that, that term you just mentioned. Uh, my dad was a college professor, um, and his story is one I could talk about forever because he came back from the war, um, could not go to postgraduate school in the South in Texas because of Jim Crow laws. And I ran across a box of, of rejection letters when he passed away <sighs> of uh, of, of, of uh, I'd say hundreds of rejection letters from colleges across the country. And the thing that uh, I recognize that he didn't look at that as something he needs to bring to his kids and say, look what they do. He looked at it as, 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 as motivation. <laughs> so they kept, he was motivated, ended up getting, going to Ohio State, where he got his, okay. his, his uh, PhD in Ohio State. That's where I was born, instead of Texas. Uh, his brother also got his PhD. Dad got his in agronomy. His, his brother got it in, in, in uh, economics. So by the age of five years old, because of this success, because of where they were going, I lived in Liberia, Africa, Africa for a couple of years. Just doing research there, and my uncle was doing another project there. Uh, we had success where the, an older uncle, who uh, was an engineer in Texas, but just loved to fly, so he bought a private plane. And I was like maybe twelve years old. He was nineteen sixty, still segregated time. And uh, who? And at that thought, who bought airplanes in those days? Nobody did. <laughs> But Nobody uncle, does now, yeah. right? Yeah, think about it. Think about it. But he decided. Well, I guess there are some people. They who, are. I, I just don't <laughs> hang out with them. <laughs> well, I didn't realize that I was hanging out with him until yeah. this morning. But anyway, my point is, uh, he loved what he was doing, but he also decided in a business sense. He lived uh, near an Air Force, Air Force base, uh, Wichita, Wichita Falls. He decided he would take letters from Wichita to Chicago. So that's a sad time business. And he made money doing it, and he ended up coming to Tallahassee at age of 12. I had a chance to to get an airplane for my first time. And uh, he taught me a little bit about uh, um, uh, airplane. Uh, uh, you know what a stall is? A, st a stall in a plane. It's always good to know what a stall is before you stall. Okay. Because you take a plane up, and the engine goes off, and you just kind of look mm -hmm. like it's falling out of the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did that. Um, and uh, and he, as I saw, he saw me getting panicked. He grabbed the plane, got control, and he, he, he got it back on. So I learned what airplane lift was from that moment uh, of going through that process. So my point is this. We had success. When I came out of uh, high school, my goal was to be a biology teacher, a bi uh, marine biologist. Football was just a way to get there. Okay. I did not think of the NFL as the end game. If I can just get a scholarship to go and get to college. And so Miami was the place. It was down south. It was around water. Because you wanted to do marine Because biology. I wanted marine biology. And I had no idea that Miami was a very bad team to play for in those days. <laughs> it was not a winning team. We're going to get hate from Yeah, you. yeah. But, <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Um, one of the things I remember, because in those days, what blacks also faced was the bigotry of low expectations. Mm. We were not expected to be leaders and to be smart and be intelligent. And I remember a uh, the, the husband of a teacher, I got the word that he didn't think I could do it. So for four years, I lived in that library because of, he was not going to be right. And that was actually the way our community was raised in those days. If so the you, oppositional force was actually the gift? It was, it was um, motivation, mm -hmm. uh, negative or not belief. Being an underdog was true motivation, and it's just a great place to be. And I will say that to anyone. If you ever find yourself being in that underdog place, embrace it. It's not only what you get a chance to prove yourself that you can get it done, but to prove other people that they misjudged it. And that's a great place to be. So that's what the community I grew up in. Um, so you were in college, and you're really <coughs> just there. The, the football was the means to support you in going to college. It was. And then finally, as I, as I got into the right position, and, um, and I realized that I was, I was just, it, it was something I could enjoy doing. I enjoyed the process, and it went on from there. I do want to say this, and we were kind of talking about this okay. before, because it was my experience of football that has given me the kind of the model of understanding how life works. Mm -hmm. 
And I call it thirteenth season. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, I went one high went my last year in high school was a disastrous year. Uh, I only reason I got to Miami was my my coach took a film from two years before, spliced it, put it to my senior year film, and sent it to Miami. So he made the last year look a little better. So he looks makes the, yeah makes look the last year look like it was the year before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and it worked. <laughs> so I got to sign that contract as soon as I figured out what was going on. But but so uh, I was the third black to get a scholarship at the University of Miami. So that was kind of the times. My high school uh, experience was kind of like the remember the Titan days. I was okay. one of four. Uh, to integrate the school. So that was kind of the era I was going through. But so I went, my last year in high school was a disaster. Four years with Miami were total losing seasons. And seven years with the Jets were also losing seasons. So my, my point is 12 years of going through giving everything you can, know, thinking that know. next year is going to be the deal. And all you have to do is do everything you can. Even if you're optimistic, at some point we get a little bit down. Yeah. In my seventh year in the NFL, I literally was thinking about retirement because I was so tired of just losing. Now, keep in mind, the other side of this, if I really was counting my blessings, I was playing a game I enjoyed and played. I was making income that was not in, available to most, and I was good at what I was doing. But yet we all have that tendency sometimes to feel sorry for ourselves. Well, yeah, because you also take this personal progression part of you, and you're thinking nothing's getting better so I'm hitting myself against this wall. And and that's really hard to push through and to stay consistent it is. when there's no fruits of your labor. So that being said, so my seventh year, I literally was thinking about retirement. I was so frustrated. And that eighth year is when I went to, I was drafted by the, I was traded to the Oakland Raiders. And that 13th season is when we went on to become Super Bowl champions. So what is the message with that? We all have our 13th season. Mm -hmm. And that's that time when, Life is just everything we worked hard for, what we sacrificed for, the hard days and long nights. We said, this is so well worth everything I went through. But we have to go through the 12 before getting to that 13th. And the 12 are those seasons where we just don't want to be there. We wanted to end quickly because it's so so painful. But this is where we learn the greatest lessons in life. Yeah. And they're the things that have served you, not just in the NFL, as you moved forward post a football career. You then had to find your way into the business world. And, you know, we our family's gone through some starting overs and losing everything financially. You filed bankruptcy, was it twice? Yep. And so those 12 season <clears throat> lessons, right? That's what you keep pulling from. And as actually I look back on it, what's made me as passionate about what I'm doing today are the yeah. lessons I learned through those those tough times. When you look up and say, wait a minute, how in the world could this happen? It's just not supposed, that was not part of the plan. I've never considered this. Right. But then you go back to doing the things that you were trained to do, not knowing you'll ever get there. And what I was trained to do growing up in my, in my community is that whatever it takes, you know, if, you're gonna, if your commitment is truly to your family, it doesn't matter what you do. As long as it's honest, it's hard. It's a good, it's a good thing. So I was for a while a chimney sweep. At night, I was a security guard because I was taught how to hustle and how to do whatever it took. Now, I also had that moment when I was sitting in this one-bedroom basement apartment with six kids, with four kids, just trying to figure out what the next steps would be. I had this moment where I realized, thank goodness this was not the end. I knew that this was going to be for my good at some point because of faith again. Right. And all you do is just keep moving one step after the next. And uh, with, with a, uh, maybe a month or two after that, getting an opportunity to work with Word Perfect. It was a corporation that's based right here in Provo. Yes, that was my first my first corporate job, and it went for 25 years. My last one was Motorola as a national account rep. So that 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 moment I went through probably serves me better now than anything I could have done in NFL. Because what is the the the, the nine words that gives that we should give to each other as Americans, and we should we should embrace our our defeats and. And use these nine words every chance we get because it gives people hope. And it is, if I can do it, you can do it. Yes. And only if you're going through it do you truly understand that because that's where the empathy comes in. That's where you understand and navigate and how you got out of it. You can turn that around and help somebody else with the same issues they're going through. So, so did you ever... <laughs> did you ever consider giving up? Did you ever feel like... I've lost too much and <coughs> I this isn't what I... I've worked my hardest. I have nothing left to give. I'm ready to, to that's give a, up. That's a good question. Uh, no. The reason why is because if you can think through issues and, and problems, you know there's an answer. 
If you have faith in God, you know he's going to be providing you a way out at some point. He's going to bless you. If you don't mind working, if work is something you embrace and you just, whatever it takes, you just work your way through. And if you commit it to your family, how can you ever quit? Mm-hmm. You see, so, so it, comes, it comes down to those four tenets again. And, and it's commitment to those four tenets that takes us through not only the toughest of times, but it gives you that those memories of great times you have. Because when it comes that down to it, and, and, and so you're experiencing this too, when it's all said and done, all the things we do, our memories of our family and those times we came together and those fun we had as we watch our kids grow, that is truly going to be the true legacy when it comes right. down to it. Not the rings, nope. not the nope. <clears throat> even the win, winning elections or any of those business achievements that we finally achieve. It is the relationships, right? It's relationships um, and all the things we do in the process should re- reflect who we are. Mm. Because what the, the obstacles we go through is just to really help us be better people. Uh, we talked about this before we got started. Uh, I, I look at one thing that life will, will, will give us an opportunity. We can either be humble or humbled. <laughs> <laughs> and this is for everybody, by the way. Right. It's the ED you want to stay away from. Right. All right. I always so say this, I want a brick, not a brick wall there we go. to whack me upside. All you have to do is go through a couple obstacles and realize, I don't really like this too yeah. much, so what can I do to stay away from it? Being humble is a big piece of it. So part of life is recognizing that we are not the center of the universe. Mm. And I think that's one of the, the biggest lessons as we grow, as we're younger and kind of growing up. Yeah. Because we all have that tendency yeah. of thinking we really do know a lot more than we think than we really know. <laughs> Till you live a little bit of life <laughs> and then you think, wait, maybe. It, it, it's, it's, it's waking up and realize, you know what, I get it. I, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. I'm willing to put my faith in those around me. I'm willing to listen. And I have a faith in God that he, ha- he knows better than I do. And I think that's such a beautiful combination. The people I admire the most are the people that have that combination of work ethic, um, bringing their talents to the table and not giving up, but also a sense of humility and someone bigger than them. And for for those that don't define God as as that bigger source, even if you are agnostic or, or even atheist, what is there something bigger than you? Because that combination, those are the leaders, those are the heroes, those are the influencers that I look to <coughs> because you get that sense of their humility. But you also see that they've achieved a lot just because they're willing to keep showing up every day. And I think the, the thing that we should all take away from a conversation like this is that hard times is nothing personal. Mm. It's something we all have to go through. It's, I mean, it's just that some people are better at hiding it. They're better at keeping that, that optimism so you never really see it. They know that some kind of way it's going to work out. So you see them with a smile at all times because they understand that the end game is, is ahead of them. It's going to be a positive one for them. If we can be that kind of person, that's great. Um, and I think the thing we do owe each other, though, no matter how far we've come, not only stay humble, but give those lessons of yeah. how we came through it. I think we need, 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 need to do more of that to I let agree. people know. I yeah. love I love hearing about the fact that you've really come to embrace the struggle because you see that that's where the gifts come, right? It's not just in the, wait, I got the promotion. <clears throat> I, I was able to fulfill my dream. Uh, and it feels like to me from listening to some of your your life story that it just kept building. Like you, you kept taking what you had in that deep South neighborhood and then took that through college and then through the NFL, through starting a business, losing all of those starting over moments in our lives that sometimes we, we don't want to celebrate that, but that you really have found a way. Can you talk to me what has motivated you or share with our viewers why politics seems like the greatest thing to do? Because I, I'm going to be honest with you. I worked on my first political campaign in Northern California as a seven-year-old. I went door to door. I took yard signs. I took flyers. And I had this, like, I was going to go be a page in D.C. And I was going to major in political science. And yet I talked to a lot of people that feel disenchanted yeah. that politics has become this blood sport. And I admire anyone. I don't care what party you affiliate with, if you're willing to be a public servant, it it takes so much courage and willingness and that humility factor because now with social media and other things, everyone seems to just want to pull everyone down and fight. Can you talk about 
What's motivated you to take all these great life experiences and say, hey, the best thing I can do at this point in my life is okay. enter politics. And it kind of goes back to the middle concept because this, where I am today, actually started when I was, was being raised in Tallahassee. I watched my dad as he gave back. He was a mentor. He was, he believed in, in, in that middle class that wanted to bring those behind them with them. And uh, when I left the NFL in 83, it was actually one of my better years. I was um, all pro. I was going, to, going into a, a new contract, uh, moving to Oakland. But this desire to start a business, to kind of get to do what's really important, which it was to me at that point, at that point was how can we impact kids are at risk. How can it impact my community that what I saw was heading in the wrong direction? And so I really took a risk to leave my game when I did to begin something I thought was even more impactful. Uh -huh. So to say the least, to have this belief and then to go through the, the downtime was kind of a double whammy and say, well, wait a minute, I thought this was I was, was trying supposed... to do something good. Yeah. But here's the thing. <clears throat> All those lessons I learned got me to where I can not only raise my family, go through the obstacles, learn my lessons, raise a family in which the message is very simple, and they start leaving high school, and that is you can go anywhere across the country as long as you start the first year off in Utah because the values we had here is what I wanted to have when mm. they left home. All six did that. All six ended up being here. I followed them, and I'm finally, once I got here, realized this is the place to build that that opportunity for kids that are at risk. So I started a nonprofit called Second Chance for Youth, working with kids coming out of the juvenile system, uh, making sure that the 70% residualism rate went the other direction. Totally into what I was doing. And it wasn't about a year or so ago, after saying for decades, I would never, ever be a politician. That I realized... You said that? Oh, yeah. I never, have never thought about it. Because people kept saying, hey... It says there's no way. It's not going to happen. And I truly meant that. But what I realized about a year or so ago is that the kids I'm working with, these kids that don't have fathers, don't have a good education, don't have hope, do not believe in our all country. All the things you had in Tallahassee. Everything I had in Tallahassee is all because of policies. I said, if we don't change the policies in D.C., these kids ah. don't have a chance in either ones across the country. So I, I, I actually took it to the Lord like we all are taught mm -hmm. to do. And I, the answer I got was, what would I have to lose? If it's meant to be, Heavenly Father will come through. If it's not meant to be, I'll still work with my kids. Either way, it's a win-win. <laughs> what I love about that is that something you shared with me before we started taping is to deal with the animosity that comes with politics, that you really have a sense of who you are and you've surrounded yourself with people that believe in you. And so all the naysayers, all of those <laughs> that want to throw the rock, so to speak, or take you down, you know who you are. And so what I hear you saying is, the risk was I, I can either jump in and try to help or I lose and I still know who I am and I still have my family. Is that what you're saying? And it's never been what other people say or what they think. And I, I was blessed to have a dad and a mom who, who taught that early. So um, so I'm blessed. I truly believe this, that I do not care what strangers think. Mm. I've I worked I work very hard throughout my life to surround myself with people I respect, people that know me. And as long as I have the respect for those I respect, I'm absolutely okay. And you have to have that, I think, yeah. coming into this game. You do. You have to know why you're in it. Yeah. And it has to be for the right reasons. And you can care less about what the naysayers say. You say that, you, this is a very positive process because you're giving your message out. And I think the message I'm giving is one, again, of hope. is one of showing that everyone deals with the same obstacles. So just hang in there. Don't give up. Don't let loose. Because... There is an answer. There's a 13 season for everybody out there. You just have to fight to hold on to get to that 13 season. And once you do, now when you look back and say, my goodness, how blessed am I? But you'll be able to pass that hope on to somebody else. And that's really, as Americans, that's what our responsibility is, is pass hope. Because that's the American way. That's what we do best. And we're just not drawn to darkness. We just never have been and we never will be. We want to go to the light. We want to go to the light. It's, we, that's that. in our DNA. I love that. So I love to ask my guests here at the middle about their manna. And I love the idea that our manna has to be collected every day, right? We can't store it up and, and not work on those those parts of ourselves that help us have this kind of attitude that you've shared with us today. What's your manna? Okay, I'm going to talk to the audience okay, about this one. Okay, let's do it. We're okay. going straight for the camera. Uh, it's interesting because once I understood um, the obstacles we'll, we'll be faced with is how do we approach it. I got to this habit of reading the Book of Mormon every single morning. And no matter how little time I had or what the obstacles I might be going through, what I realized is that 
every single morning, there's a refreshment of the soul. There's something that's that do that happens that allows you to go through that day just trying to be a little bit better than you were before. And I've also realized that as you go through obstacles, obstacles change and so does the message come through. The message that we get from Heavenly Father will always be different based on what we need at that particular time. So it's a manna to me that uh, I cannot, I don't take for granted. Uh, I, I want to make sure I, I take part of every single morning. Um, and I want to make sure that what I'm learning from that, I can give to someone else. Because that's the other part of, of this process. I look at it as a, like a, a water hose. You know, uh, we have the source, who's Heavenly Father. We know who he wants to bless as our brothers and sisters. If we can be that water hose that gives that hope to our brothers and sisters and that faith, we can't help but get wet in the process. Yeah. And and so that's the way I look at, at our our responsibility to be conduits to what we're learning. And there's nothing more more rewarding to know every single day that there's a message that comes through to us. And we have a Heavenly Father who's going to be with us and allowing us to to accept and receive and have, bear with us the, the Holy Ghost. So that's my manner. I love it. Okay. Reading scripture, there's no better, right? Yeah. And I feel like we're living it. When I read those stories of so long ago, I feel like we're... We're living them today. Thank you for sharing your your message of hope and in using your heart and your your head and your hands and your home. There we go. Help. Got it. I did. I did. And I love that. I love having those little ways to remember really complex issues that are become the anchor. Yeah. And thank you for sharing um, so many middles with us of kind of pushing through and and embracing when it's oppositional and it's hard and it's frustrating. And the idea that the miracle's coming. I love that. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Prayers for you and whatever the future holds. We'll be cheering you on here. On Thank you. And if I can just say, everyone has a 13th season. Hang in there. Know it's coming. And when it does, you will respect and appreciate everything you've gone to get there. So just hang in and make it happen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you for liking and subscribing and, and sharing our episodes with your friends and family. We, we love having the comments and response and gratitude that we read from you. And we appreciate you joining us here today on The Middle.